everybody, welcome to Board Game Breakfast. I'm Tom Vassell, and I'm glad you're with us today. It's another week, and this week is fantastic. Today's Memorial Day for all those in America. Happy Memorial Day. But at the end of the week, we'll be going to the motherland, the UK, and we'll be in England this week. It's going to be exciting. We'll see you all. Me and Z Garcia are going to the UK Games Expo in Birmingham. So uh, we actually talked about our schedule in another video. You can check it out, the UK Games Expo. We give our itinerary. We're doing shows there. We'll have some promos there. We're going to be playing games games there. We hope to see you there. So that's one thing. Sam and Roy Canada are going to the Come On Expo in Atlanta. So if you're there, have fun seeing both of them. That's going to be fantastic. Now that means, since we'll be gone much of the week, not as many live videos this week, but we on Tuesday, it'll also be, be live game testing. It'll be mostly Sam and Roy. On Thursday, they'll also be hosting Board Game Breakfast Live. So that'll be fantastic. I hope you guys come for that. So that's what's happening next or this coming week. Contest. We had a contest last week for Bulk, and our winner is Catherine Nyan. So congratulations to you. That's very exciting, and we're having another contest. There's five contests. This is contest number four. If you want to win a copy of Bulk, just go to their website, balk.co, and check out the game there. Email us at contest at dicetower.com. In the subject heading, put Bulk 4. This is the fourth contest. And here's the question I want you to answer. There's four colors of cards, blue, green, purple. What's the fourth color? What's the color I did not say? Send that to us at contest.dicetower.com and you could win a copy of the game and a $50 gift certificate. All righty. Well, that's our contest. You can still sign up for Dice Tower Con and Dice Tower Retreat, but right now, let's get started with this show. So here's what I found on the internet this week. Some of it from you guys sending me emails about it. And if you have something you'd like me to show on this, you can always email me at tom at dicetower.com. So there's an uh, article I found on one board game family. Can we stop with the minis now? We're not playing games. We're not playing toys. We're playing games, says this person. First of all, uh, I like to say I disagree with a whole chunk of this. Yes, miniature games make a lot of Kickstarter. Yes, there's games that probably have miniatures that don't need to. But yes, there's lots of games without miniatures. So whatever. Miniatures are toys. There's no question on that. But so are little pieces of cardboard. They're all toys. I feel like there's a third week in a row now I've talked about this one. Jamie Stegmeier posted another thing, The Truth About Stonemeyer Games on his website where he writes a very long treatise on answers a lot of questions that his critics have mentioned or asked about him. Let's jump to comedy here. Meeple Mountain has this article about local man sleeves games, cards, and himself. And then talking about comedy on For Chits and Giggles, they take a set, they take a look at the unsets for magic, like unglued, things like that. And that's interesting. Magic the Gathering is a, is a game that takes itself very seriously sometimes, except for the unsets, and this talks about them a little bit. Rodney Smith did a video called Show Me the Money, where he talked about paid reviews. So he, he gave his different opinions on that. I'll talk about that a little bit later on in this episode. Uh, and then I found a couple board game geek lists on Board Game Geek. One about shrinking games, showing pictures of how people take a big game and make it small. Don't have a lot of space? You might want to check this list out. And then another geek list, the good, the bad, and the ugly of typography on game boxes. I've certainly complained about this in the past, but this is, is like an expert taking a look at typography of games and telling us which ones are good and bad and not. That's what I found on the internet this week. Let's keep moving. Hey everybody, it's Roy Candy and this is Printed Pieces. We're talking about 3D printing and what it can bring to the tabletop hobby. Today I'm going to be looking at a game that I really enjoy and it just came out, but there's already a lot of really cool things for it on Thingiverse. And one of the things I want to look at is the terrain for the Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth game. So this is a cooperative game that uses an app, but it's really cool because there is already a lot of like 3D printed stuff that you can get for this game. People have made inserts and different things like that, but the thing I really want to look at is the terrain they have made. So the game basically you can run around like out on the world, but then there's also where it zooms into like these different maps where you're like going through taverns or like sieging a castle and things like that. So one of the really cool things I printed out were these like little walls that you can put on the board to 
separate the different areas and you normally get these cardboard tokens, but this you can actually use these cool 3D printed walls and they have like 3D printed statues and um, different like bushes and barrels and all and tables and all that stuff. And there are several people that have compiled files that work great for this and have designed things that look awesome and little fireplace things as well. So definitely make sure to check out a lot of the stuff for Journeys in Middle Earth and it just helps bring the theme of the game as you have your miniatures running around 3D objects on the board. Um, so there's all sorts of cool stuff you can print out for that as well. So let me know in the comments down below what you guys have been printing out and if there's anything you're interested in in 3D printing, let me know below and I'll see you on the next one. Hey, hey everybody, Z Garcia here and for today's Chop Shop, which is a game I'm letting go from my collection, I am going to be taking a look at Bastion here. Uh, this is a cooperative tower defense style game and there's a few reasons why I'm letting this one go. The main one being I have a ton of cooperative games. It's probably my favorite style of game and uh, so, you know, I just can't have that many so I'm letting some go. But also, it's a tower defense game, which is not really something I'm particularly excited about. And I've already got a few that I think do that job well and do it with a little more pizzazz than Bastion here. Uh, things like, you know, uh, ghost stories. And even if I'm looking at something much smaller, the, the solitaire or two-player game Sylveon does very much a tower defense feel with just cards. And it does that well and in an interesting and, and difficult way. The other thing is that this one, the variability isn't really there. The game is sort of the same game from play to play. And while it is puzzly, it does not mask that puzzle uh, in, a more, in an interesting enough way where I stop seeing it. And I just think about challenges instead of, well, this is mechanical and a puzzle. The pieces are very nice in the game. You're going to have this central board uh, and then around that you put these that all link together to make up uh, the hexagonal board on the outside of it. There's cards, there's gorgeous tokens in here, but for example, all the characters have no special powers, they're not unique, and then the proceedings are real. Put out a token, take two tokens. Uh, put this one here, wipe these away and keep them. Spend three bread to kill that guy, but it's all that. It's all very, very mechanical. So. That's mainly why I'm letting this one go. I had a few good plays of it, and then it stopped being exciting for me. So that's Bastion. Maybe it'll be something that's up your alley if you're a huge tower defense fan. There's not that many of them, so maybe this one is one that will appeal to you if you're looking for a lighter tower defense style co-op game. Uh, but other than that, that's it for me. Thanks for checking this out, and enjoy the rest of your breakfast. Hey folks, welcome back to another Accessorize segment here on Board Game Breakfast. I'm Sam Healy, and uh, today we're taking a look at some dice that are offered by uh, a man by the name of Bob Stout. He runs Dice Emporium, which is a website that you can go take a look at. He has over 3,000 styles of dice that you can go get there, and he offers them from uh, in different sizes, anywhere from 5 millimeters on up to 55 millimeters. And he also offers free domestic shipping for orders that are over 20 dollars so take that all into effect let's get down to the table take a look at the dice and then we'll come back with some thoughts there to close out the video in just a few moments let's get to it so here's just a sampling of the different kinds of dice that uh, bob offers on his site we first of all have this antique nickel metal dice set uh, that you can use here has a little digital numbers on them it look, looks pretty cool uh, then you also have this one right here it's the uh, uh, the layered dice set this one is specifically pink purple I think yellow and blue uh, so uh, these can be found under the HD dice uh, for on his website and then he also has some singulars here that uh, just represent the different styles he actually has like uh, 40 different styles for example of the animal dice that you can get and then you have these different chess x style dice that are here uh, the a uh, lot of different colors here there's the uh, pop art with the blue numbers here and then you also have the uh, uh, oxy copper and blue color here as well then here you have the maple green and yellow 
looking die there. And then over here, you have a, a sunburst with the red numbers. And then you have the uh, sky with the silver numbers here. And uh, here you have water lily with white in it, which is really kind of a marble has a marble look to it. So that's pretty cool as well. So uh, here's just another source, I guess you could say, uh, of dice that you can buy uh, on the web. So that's that for another accessorized segment here on Board Game Breakfast. I hope you uh, go take a look at uh, what Bob has to offer there over there at Dice Emporium. You know, we're just showcasing things so that you can fulfill your hobby uh, to your liking, I guess. Uh, so go check them out, see what you think. Uh, but thanks for joining us here. Let's get back to the rest of your breakfast. In last week's segment, I talked about Orleans. This week, I'm talking about Orleans Invasion and how it differs from Orleans coming up. Hi everyone, it's Stella from Ripple University. Hope you're well. All Want Invasion is also designed by Rainer Stockhausen and also a pool building game. The main difference is that in All Want Invasion, you work together with your friends to achieve common objectives and also individual objectives. That's the favorite part of All Want Invasion anyway that I play. Each player dealt different character and has different personal objective that he or she needs to achieve. This gives the game a more variable and replayability. I love All Ones Invasions, probably more than All Ones. It is team puzzle solving game, essentially. Each person needs to give their opinion and contribution if you want to win the game. If there is alpha player, you should probably be safe for this one because you need to draw your own chips out of the bag, then assign the chips yourself. And this planning phase is done simultaneously. The pool winning element is the same as All Ones. You put back all chips each round, so there's a chance that you probably won't draw certain chips the whole game. Game feels tight, again like all horns. There are many things that you feel like you want to do, but need to filter what you really need to do and what really is important at certain time. I played the estate manager, it feels like treading water. My objective was to pay certain things each round, like money, guild hall, certain chips or workers, building and so on. I got to plan ahead to make sure I can fulfill the different objective each round. Otherwise, the team loses. So that's all on the inspections. Next week, I will talk about Altiplano. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy my segment, please consider checking out Meeple University on YouTube. On our channel, we do a lot of overview, how to play, play through, review, and vlog. See you next week. So not as much coming from the Dice Hour this week because we're going to be traveling uh, all over the place. We're going to try to put up some videos of some of the places that we've been to over the course of this week. If we can't flip them this week, then they'll be going up next week, which means next week might be have a ton of videos going up. We'll have to wait and see. But we're going to try to get stuff up. We're going to be uh, posting. There will be some reviews that are going up next week from Sam and Z. I'm going to try to get some videos up myself and some first impressions and things like that. I just can't guarantee what's going to go up and when. And also, today is Memorial Day, so we're going to take at least one day off this week. And we'll be back, of course, full blast and full bore next week. As that's being said, though, we have the podcast going up. Mandy and Suzanne's podcast is going up on the Dice Tower tomorrow. And there are lots and lots of uh, cool podcasts. You will never run out of things to listen to. Just check out DiceTowerNetwork.com. Fantastic podcast there to listen to while you're traveling. Download them, check them out. Welcome everybody to another installment of, if you like that, you might like this. Now this week is something a little different. We're looking at Board Game Geek, so I thought I'd mix things up a little in my segment as well. Now Board Game Geek, for me, when I first got into the gaming hobby, was a fantastic resource. I used it a lot at the beginning to look at the hotness or the top 100 games. And for a while, I was trying to get all the games in the top 100, figuring that if they were that highly ranked, then they were games I should try. Now I can't say I was disappointed as many of those games I have thoroughly enjoyed. But the more games I played, the more I felt that there were games that suited me, but maybe weren't that, that popular with the general public. So in this segment, I'm going to show you three games I personally really enjoy, but that fall way out of the top 100 or even the top 1000 for that matter. So why don't we get into it? Now the first game is called Affliction, Salem 1692. This is currently ranked 5,284. Affliction is like a worker placement game where you are placing out your workers on different actions, but you're going to be doing it in turn order. 
But you don't take the action until everybody has placed, and then they go off in action number order. You're telegraphing what you want to do during the round, and no, that does not sit well with some people, as does the difference between going first and going last in a round is very substantial. Now, the theme of this game is indicated by the title. It's set during the Salem Witch Trials, but it's more about casting accusations and arresting people than the witches themselves. All the character cards in the game are based on real people and families, and most of the cards have special abilities when they're in your circle. So you want to be protecting them so that other players cannot arrest them while you are trying to arrest the people in their circles. There is a lot of back and forth between the different players, with some take that elements, but those can be uh, mitigated to some degree. A really fun game that has fallen under the radar from a small publisher called DPH Games. Definitely one that I would suggest seeking out to try. The second game I want to talk about is called Damage Report. This game is currently ranked 4,788. Now this one is a Kickstarter game and I don't believe the campaign went that smoothly. Now the game itself is a real-time co-op game where your turns are governed by sand timers. Each character in the game has a special ability and you'll pick one scenario from the book to play. After setting up the board, you're going to start the main game timer. Then each player will flip their sand timer and start to take actions. The game can be thought of as kind of like a logistics game of each player calling out what they need to fix their section of the ship while trying to figure out how to get their resources to the other players or other sections. When your sand timer runs out, you need to flip it over and place it on the furthest left circle that matches the current life support system. So you want to make sure that life support is not damaged or it's going to take you longer to do everything. When your sand timer runs out, you flip it again into the next circle until the sand timer is back to the green circle and you can start your actions again. Now this game has always been a hit or miss with my group when I play with it. Some groups really get into it and love the abilities and the stress of the game, while others really dislike the game. And I think that has played out by the ranking, as it's not without its warts and definitely plays better at a higher player count. Now this game is hard to get now because I think it's out of print, but if you see this cheap, and you like the stress of real-time game, you may want to check it out. That is Damage Report. And the final game is called Rhine River Trader. Now this is ranked 7,731. Now this really seems to be a game that few people like, but for me, it really hit a chord. This game is fundamentally a commerce and logistics game. You are trying to get products from point A to point B to fulfill your contracts. Certain modes of transportation only stop at certain areas and each mode of transportation travels at different speeds and they all have a limited cargo space. There is a fair bit of math involved in trying to figure out what the other players are trying to do. If they put their cargo on a ship and paid to stop at a certain stop, then you can piggyback on the ship to stop at the same city avoiding playing that stoppage fee. But if you want to get your cargo on the ship, there may not be space left. And each container you load on transportation will cost you money. Are you sure you're going to be able to get the exact cargo delivered to the exact time at the best price? Now this is game will you will not do well in your first playthrough. There are a lot of moving pieces to your logistics empire. And if you suffer from analysis paralysis, this game will definitely not be for you. I really have enjoyed my plays of this, but unfortunately many people I've played with didn't because the amount of math, planning, second guessing, coupled with some luck for what contracts come up and around. The mechanisms of the game are not difficult to grasp but it's more about the most efficient way to achieve them is where the heart of this game is. Now, if that sounds interesting, I would suggest checking out Rhine River Trader, but remember it is ranked 7,731. Now, I hope you have found these games, uh, some of these games interesting, and maybe you'll dabble your toes in the depths of Board Game Geek ranking to find games that may not be, you know, enjoyed by the general public, but they do resonate with you. I'd love to hear in the chat or comments about games that you love that fall outside the top 1,000 games and think they, and you think deserve more love. Hello, and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. Here I have Donkey Kong, published in 1982 by Milton Bradley. This is a two to four player game in which you're trying to rescue a fair maiden. Can you score enough points to win the game? Let me set this up and show you how it works. So this is what the game board will look like set up. First, you gotta put the barrels inside Donkey Kong's arm. Every player is going to pick a color Mario, and every player is gonna get dealt three cards face up. At the beginning of every player's turns, you're going to release a new barrel, like so. You're gonna roll two six-sided dice. The white dice is gonna be move Mario spaces and up ladders, and the red dice is gonna move the barrels down the girders. 
Barrels will move down the girders until they hit something. When they hit your pawn, you will play one of your cards into your used pile, face down. If a, if a barrel ever reaches the flaming oil can, a fireball comes into play. Same thing happens, but the fireballs will move up the girders. However many pips the red dice shows. You just replace the barrel in the Donkey Kong. First person that makes it all the way up to the finish gets a bonus 500 points. You count up all the cards that you have used through the game. Highest total wins the game. Everybody knows that I love gimmicks in board games, and this one is no exception. I just love how Donkey Kong releases the barrels. Also, most of the board games that were taken from arcade games back in the day were spot on on how you played the arcade game. This one is no exception. Well, that's all the time I have for now. If you have a comment, comment below, or you can tweet them to me at Retro Board Gamer. And as always, may your rolls be high. So what's getting added to the library this week? Well, Duel Star Island really enjoyed this two-player game. Perdition's Mouth, Abyssal Rift, I know that I wasn't so keen on it, but I know other people are going to enjoy this one. Copenhagen, nice light game. A lot of people are going to enjoy that. Dawn of the Peacemakers, another one I wasn't real keen on, but I know a lot of people like it and has fantastic components. And a bunch of two-player games we're adding. Seven Wonders Duel. Targi, Starship Catan, Asante, which has Jambo inside it, Heave Ho, and Thunder and Lightning. So that's pretty cool. And then we're adding Archmage, Netatanka, and Code 777. Lots of great games. Very excited about this. That's what we're adding to the library this week. Hi, Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games. Today I want to talk about how games affect your communication styles. Do particular games affect the way that you communicate with other people around the table? And I guess what I'm getting at here is that are the games that we tend to think of as more interactive games, maybe the Ameritrash games where there potentially is some direct combat, are those games more likely to lead to the type of maybe trash talking that you might find around a table rather than a Euro game, maybe kind of a, a multiplayer solitaire efficiency puzzle type game where you maybe are so focused on what you're doing. Can you still have trash talking in those types of games? Now, I want to preface this by saying I'm going to assume that this game scenario we have is one where everybody is relatively familiar with each other, they feel comfortable in each other's space, and they know each other relatively well. Uh, I was thinking about this because my uh, constant arch nemesis and occasional friend Dan Hughes was talking about how he thinks that British people, and I don't want to startle you, but Dan is British, um, he was saying that British people, he feels, tend to be more boisterous in their communication and they trash talk each other. It doesn't matter the type of game. They can trash talk over a game of Agricola, perhaps. Um, and so I wondered... Is this really a cultural thing, or is it perhaps maybe the type of games that you play? Uh, do you find that in your game groups, you either will constantly have that type of boisterous table talk, no matter the type of game, or that that communication will depend on the type of game that you're playing? Is it a cultural thing? Is it more about the game? Is it more about the particular alchemy of that group? I'm just interested in your thoughts on this, so if you can let me know in the comments below, I'd love to hear it. Thank you so much for your time, as always, and have a great day! Hi, we're Board Game Opinions. My name's Jonathan. I'm Steve. I'm Amy. I'm Mark. And this is our Speed Quiz, where contestants, in this case these three, are attempting to guess um, games that fall into particular categories. And this week's category is Animal Games. So I've gone on Board Game Geek, apparently there is a category for Animal Games. So I think it's a game where animals feature in some kind of prominent way. Uh, you can have anything, incidentally, in the top 500 on Board Game Geek. And there are 23 possible games, according to the list from Board Game Geek, that fall into that category. So, are you ready? We'll start with Steve, because you're closest. Off you go. Agricola. Yes. Root. Yes. Caverna. Yes. Mice and Mystics. Uh, no. Everdell. 
Yes. Arcadia Quest. Hang on, hang on. Everdell. No, not Arcadia Quest. Dungeon Pet. Yes. Animal upon animal. No. Dungeon Keeper. No. Oh. Takenoko. Yes. Oh. Uh, Carcassin Safari. No. Uh, Kemet. No. Uh, Grickler Cave vs. Cave. Yes. Very good. Ooh. Uh, cockroach poker. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Damn not it. high enough. This is not all cushions big and small, or is that the one you just gave? Oh. That's, that's the one I think okay. you mentioned. Oh, okay. I don't know. Let me think. Uh, I'll open it to the floor then. There's a few seconds left. Uh, right, raccoon tycoon. No. Oh. <laughs> and that's time! <laughs> Give me a minute to top up the scores and we'll see how they did. Alright, I've added up the scores. Instantly, I forgot to mention, but they were getting two points if they'd named a game that I hadn't played yet. Only one of them was named, which was Everdell. I've not got around to playing it, so Amy got two points for that one. And final scores were Steve got four, Amy got three, Mark got one. So oh. Steve is our winner today. Uh, other games you could have had would have been Evolution, Camel Up, Bunny Kingdom, Bear and Park, Raptor, Stuffed Fables, just to name a few. Alright, thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Can I, morning run? Yes, uh, I wanted you here because welcome to the pitch. No, 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 no. We, we haven't done a pitch in months. Yes, I know. It's time to 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 fill the holes in our shelf. Pitch, we purged. Listen to me. There is this new board game that is all about battling. It's a, a campaign game, and it looks so amazing. It's got miniatures. I would love to paint those miniatures. Uh, <laughs> it's called. Lord of the Rings. Oh my goodness! <laughs> You're not really selling this well. These are all not points that sell a game to me. Journeys you know? in Middle Earth. But is battling. An, um, well, you, well, you're not battling me. Miniatures. You're, Lord of the Rings. You're, you're battling. The, the, there's an app that you use an Apps. app, and the choices you make uh, give you a different story every time. So you could replay this endlessly. This to me, this all sounds expensive. It is expensive, but what have I told you that I have someone who will be at Dice Tower Con as well and he might be able to get it for me for half the price as it is here in Europe. That must be a very good friend. Well, Brent, you are a good friend. Okay. Um, uh, it's going to take you away from me for hours because I... I want you to, to play with me. I'm supposed to play this with you. Okay, okay, okay. Um, uh... It's still um, more than a month away, right? Yes, it is. And one and a half. This months. is what you do with things you're not sure if you want to get them. Mm -hmm. You think about them. Think about this for a while, and if you still want it in a month, okay, you can do it. Okay, that sounds like a so deal. So this is a. It's a deal. It's a, it's a deal. Okay. It's delicious. Thanks, everyone. Let's <laughs> check in, in in a month and see what happens. My name is Dave Luzon. I'm Ilka. Bye. Bye. Go shower. So this comes up on the internet often, and I often, I often don't get involved in the arguments and such on the internet, or I just talk about them on my show. So that's what I'm doing here. Rodney mentioned uh, uh, people talking about paid reviews, and so I'll repeat something that he said, and I've thought I'll be even stronger on it. I don't know anybody other than a big public domain website, right? Like maybe some of these bigger websites that don't normally review board games. But of the board game reviewers that you know, like us and Shut Up and Sit Down and all these guys, I don't know a single one that does a paid review. This is brought up all the time. What about people who do paid reviews? I don't know anybody who does them. Now, I know a lot of people who do paid previews. There's quite a few of them. You can just go to Kickstarter and go through it. We have Mark Street who does them on our own channel. Paid previews are essentially advertisements. Straight up, they're paid for, and they should be labeled as such. We label ours as clearly as we possibly can, and that's the end of that. I think a lot of people mix paid previews with paid reviews. But I wanted to talk a little bit about this because the honesty and integrity always comes up, and I saw comments on this, and I'm like, well, this is just right, and this is just wrong. It really is a mix of what do we, how do you, how do you know what's right and what's wrong? So let's say publisher A gives me money. They say, we'll give you this if you give this game a good review. I say, I don't really like the game. It doesn't matter really if I like it or not, right? But I give a, a good review to the game and I take their money. That's wrong. I think most people would accept that. If a company gave me money 
with the expectation that I'm going to give a good review. I, I won't do that and again, I don't know anyone who does that, but that's just straight up bribery. Now, what if I say I charge for all my reviews? $500 for a review. You pay me money and I did a review. I'm gonna say exactly what I think about it. Well, I have probably less of a problem with people doing that, we don't do that here. But there's still gonna be people who look at that and say, you're taking money and it's the, the temptation to be, to softball the review is definitely there. Again, that's, this is very rare or if it even happens at all. So then, there's a myriad of in-between stuff. You guys seen when I open my unboxings, sometimes there's a stuffed animal or Mayfair used to send me a box of chocolate every year. What about gifts? There's never anything valuable that I can see. I think the most valuable thing is like a t-shirt or a hat that I've gotten. I will say that for myself, like 90% of the time the games are really bad. You know, and that sort of gift doesn't affect me at all. Mostly I don't even keep the gifts. I might give them to my kids or whatever. I don't care about them. But people can look at that as a loss of integrity because you accepted a gift. What if I'm out to eat with Publisher A and they pay for a meal? Could that be construed as them paying me money for maybe future good reviews? Or just being friends with the publishers? In fact, there are some people who insist that a reviewer should really have no good friendships with publishers and should not even be involved in this and should just stay completely clear so that their mind is at ease so that they can say negative things about whatever they want. Well, the integrity of a personal, you know, of a person is up to them. I hope too that I value my integrity very highly. That's something I feel pretty strongly about. When you see me say I like a board game or I don't like a board game, I mean it. I really do. My opinions change over the years sometimes, but when I, at the moment of me saying it, I believe it with all my heart. I won't pull punches on a negative review. I, if I love a game, I'm gonna gush over it. And I think I've shown this myriads of times, and you can see publishers that I'm really good friends with, and I will tap dance all over their games. This has gotten me many negative letters from publishers. I probably have gotten over 100 letters, emails from publishers, who have yelled at me for reviewing their games negatively. Now, just to be clear, this is mostly very tiny publishers. The bigger publishers almost never do this, even though at a convention we'll meet and they'll be like, I can't believe you said this about my game. And I'm like, yeah, sorry, but I still said it. And I'll say it again because it's the right thing for me to do. I need to be honest about my opinions. And I certainly attempt to do so. No friendship, no dinners, no stuffed animal in a box. None of that changes anything. Even if we previewed the game earlier, and Mark previewed the game, I don't care what Mark thought about the game. If I don't like it, I'm gonna say I don't like it. That's just the way it goes. If they advertise on our channel, they give us promos for a Kickstarter, I'm gonna say what I think about games. Now I realize that some people aren't happy with that. Some people want complete separation from the publishers. Well, we have publishers, we work with them as much as possible because it helps them out and it helps us out. It helps us keep the lights on. Still, most of our money comes from uh, backers in our, in our Kickstarter, although even part of that is because of promos that publishers give us. But we say what we think. And I came to the conclusion a long time ago that some people are never gonna be happy with whatever we say. That's okay. I can sleep at night. I can look God in the eyes and say, I'm not lying about these games. I'm giving them my best effort. I'm giving them the best review that I can do. I can't speak for everybody else. I know some people insist that we need some like high regulation journalism. Guys, the, the 1980s are over. The internet's where it's at now. Everything's mixed up. Everything's all over the place. Publishers, distributors, it's all mixed together. How can we stay afloat in such a mess? I can be honest. I can be nice honest. You know, I could probably be nicer, I suppose, to games I'm not a big fan of. Uh, and I gotta be friendly, because I do have to work with people and stuff. But at the end of the day, I have to tell the truth, and I have to live with that. You may not believe I'm not telling the truth about games. I've seen people say that. There's no way you like that game. All right, well, don't believe me or not. But I did. I enjoyed it, and I said I enjoyed it. Besides, what benefit is there to me saying I like games that are bad? Ugh, that just will leave a bad taste in my mouth. 
Anyway, that's what I think about the whole situation. I've changed zero people's minds by saying this. Because if you thought we were unethical here at the Dice Tower, you probably still do. But my hope is that the vast majority of you realize we're attempting to give you the straight, honest truth about games. Most games are fun, I think. Lots of games aren't. We tell you both. Hello, my name's Jonathan from Board Game Opinions. Now, I started using Board Game Geek 10 years ago, I think. It's been a long time. And when you first start using it, there's a bit of a culture shock. You know, you get to the homepage, it's like, you've gone back in time or something. It looks incredibly outdated. It looks like it did 10 years ago, and it looked outdated 10 years ago. But actually, there is a fantastic gold mine of information on Board Game Geek, as long as you can figure out how to use it. And that is one of the issues with the site. It is very difficult to use but it's also incredibly popular and once you take the time to figure out how it works, you can find all sorts of really helpful things on it. I mean, I use it probably almost every day, you know, many times a week I'm using Board Game Geek for one thing or another. Anybody in the board game industry is gonna be very familiar with that website. It is the number one website for board games. In fact, I think it's one of the top 2000 websites in the world. That's not board gaming websites, that's any website at all. It's one of the top 2000 in the world. That's a tremendous achievement. In fact, I think amongst US, viewers, it's one of the top 1,000 websites. So it is incredibly popular, but it's quite difficult to use at first. Uh, and the way I got into it really was just by searching for board games. You kind of go to the home page, and there's the bizarre contests for games I've never heard of. There's the Gone Cardboard section. I've no idea what that is, even 10 years later. There's sort of random photos and things. What you really want to do is just go to the search bar at the top and search for a board game you're interested in. Once you get to the game page, there's all kinds of helpful information. You know how many players it takes, how long the game takes, who designed the game. And a lot of the time when I go to Board Game Geek, what I'm really after, or certainly the first few times I went there, I wanted reviews. It's actually quite difficult to find reviews of games on the site. There's no reviews tabs. There's a whole bunch of tabs for the game, but none of them say reviews. The way it works is, in fact, it reminds me a little bit like a, an old-fashioned library. You kind of need a librarian to show you around the place. Um, but there's actually a videos tab. If you go to that, you can see video reviews. And if you go to the forums tab, the part of the section for forums is for reviews if you want to read written reviews. So that's probably the best place to start, but um, there's lots of really useful features of Board Game Geek if you play with it. You can subscribe to things, so you get emailed when extra reviews and things are added about a game. Uh, you can see what's called the hotness, which is how popular different games are. So if you want to know what the latest games are that everybody's talking about, there's a hotness bar down the left-hand side, which is actually very helpful. I often use that. But the best thing to do with Board Game Geek is just to play around with it. It is incredibly useful. Trust me, you just have to spend a bit of time to get over that initial hurdle to start with. Hey guys, it's Nick back for a Mental Health Minute, and we're here to talk about one-time only games, specifically the Unlock series. Now, I was recently sent these from a friend, shout out to Second Chance Shelf here on the Dice Tower. Look them up, these are really great. And I found these in that box. And he sent me these because he's played them. And we're trying to like pass them around the Dice Tower and other people to, you know, experience these games. Now, I've never played them. I'm not gonna review them for a little bit because I haven't played them yet, but the idea in the board gaming community that you can just have these games that, you know, you play once, $15, $20, and then you, you just send them away. Send them, send them to someone else. And sending it to someone else can make their day because like, hey, this one's pretty cool to find in the mail. And it maybe give a little bit of a second look to one-time only games. Now, I'm not a legacy fan, I don't like games like that, but games like this just, they, they spark my imagination a little bit. I, I think it really gets into my head that like, okay, you're gonna play once. And I think if I take that out of my mindset, that I'm just playing these games that a friend sent me and put together, I think it's a great thing for the board gaming hobby and I think it's a great thing for your state of mind. You played it once, oh, now I have to get rid of it. You're giving it to a friend and making it a better experience for them where well, they didn't even have to pay for it, it's a gift. And that's something the board gaming hobby can really benefit from. I Again, I don't like legacy games, but this idea, this concept is really good. We're trying to set up a little chain of these, of people sending them to each other. Try to do that with your friends. Have you all paid like $5 for it and then one plays it, one plays it, one plays it, one plays it, and pass it along. So, do you like these types of games? Let me know in the comments below what you think about them and what you think about this idea.
Enjoy your breakfast. Hi, I'm Doug Jr. And I'm Doug III. And we're from Doug and Doug Gaming, and you're watching A, a Fellowship, Fellowship of Meeples. So let's continue our discussion about some of those nasty game night habits that maybe we ourselves are sometimes guilty of. Now, we all know that it is very enjoyable to have a snack at the game table, but should we eat at game night? Yes! Well, obviously some of us like to eat snacks a bit more than others, but the real question is, is it acceptable to eat at the table at game night? Now, our local game store sells snacks, so it's pretty common for us to have a few snacks around the game table, but there are a few tips that can help us keep those snacks where they belong. If you have a drink that has a lid, take advantage of that lid. In between turns, after you're done taking your first sip, put the cap back on. We don't need that spilling on stuff. Uh, if you have a cup that doesn't have a lid, see about placing it not on the game table. Maybe on a tray or something that just in case it gets knocked over, you're not risking whatever game is on the table in front of you. Finger foods like chips and popcorn, they're going to leave your fingers greasy. So keep some napkins nearby and use them every time it's your turn before you touch those components. Even healthier snacks like fruit, for instance, there is that moisture factor and the sugar as well. So make sure you're being careful about what you get on your fingertips before handling dice, cards, or meeples, or whatever you have. Finally, if the owner of the game requests that you don't eat, don't eat. You'll survive for an hour or two. And of course, if the game is yours, our personal recommendation is sleeve your cards, because cards are always the first thing to get damaged. Remember, you want to enjoy your game night, but you also want to be considerate. Do you have any tips or food-related horror stories in your gaming experience? Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to enjoy the rest of your breakfast. But remember to keep those fingers clean. And that's it for another board game breakfast. Off to England we go. I'm going tonight. We're flying out there. So hopefully I'll see several of you out there. It's going to be a fantastic time. But then we'll be back and we're getting ready for Origins. Z and Roy Kennedy will be at Origins this year. And Dice Tower Con. There's so much planning, things to do with that. I'm always very excited about that. And I can't wait to see many of you there. But if you can't make any of these cons, we'll be on the airwaves. We'll be seeing you. Until next time, I'm Tom Basil, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Basil and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Sauer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool Stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.